All right, thanks, Nicole. Um, and thanks for inviting me, Nicole. This is uh, this will be first time I think I've done a live stream talking about my work, but I think we're, we're all learning and adjusting to this stuff. So what I've got on the screen right now is just, uh, I think the project that is uh, going to take a pause for a little while, while, while things settle down. And uh, these are forms that I've made through a couple processes using CAD that uh, I'm eventually going to make molds of, and we can talk more about that project as we go through. Um, so I understand y'all's class is about plastics. Um, I think that's, that's such a cool class idea. And I have, I guess, in art making, I think plastic kind of comes in and out. But for a while, when I, when I lived in Houston, um, I worked in manufacturing. and We made a lot of funny things out of plastic for the company I worked for. And I wanted to start off with uh, maybe kind of like a, a fun video that uh, I made yesterday. It's sort of like a... Um, collection of all the Instagram stories I made over the couple years that I worked there. Um, and it's about plastic. So uh, it's about six, six and a half minutes long. Uh, we can watch that and then we can uh, talk more about specific work.
Okay, that was probably one of the most obsessive while uh, very distracted things I've put together in a while. Uh, so that was um, like in the last couple of years I was in Houston. I'm from uh, Houston, Texas. Um, <laughs> um, oh, by the way, I'm Alex Goss. I always forget to uh, say these things. It's forget that there's people on the other side of this. Hi, hello. Hope everyone's doing all right. Um, yeah, so I moved back to Texas um, about 2014 um, for a variety of reasons, um, but one was to work in manufacturing um, as a means to figure out my studio practice. I was living in New York, and the kind of things I, I wanted to make, I just wasn't, there wasn't a good way to do it, at least with um, kind of what I had access to at the time. So this is um, uh, one of the last Sears around. Um, this is in downtown Houston. Um, it's where I spent a lot of time during my, my days. Uh, I was in downtown Houston. I worked uh, at a school um, right around the corner from this building. Um, but so I, I kind of found a way to become a pedestrian in Houston again. If, if you know Texas or you know the South, it's very kind of car dependent, car centric place, but especially uh, Houston, especially as like an oil capital. Um, of the world, or like a country, maybe not the world, but like that's the economy in Houston is oil and you know driving cars is like patriotism there. So there's not a lot of sidewalks, there's not a lot of infrastructure for pedestrians, but I still try to find a way to um, kind of have that connection to um, walking that I did in New York that I, that I missed. Um, and when I walked, um, you know, I realized there's a different sense of scale here too, um, with relation to like the machines and the architecture, um, and then like human bodies, because you hardly ever saw anyone else in the street. Um, I found that like you would see something that was like interesting or a person that like, I don't know, was interesting, but, like people watching at a very different scale. And so I'd take pictures of things that I thought were like beautiful moments. Um, and then I'd c come back and like look at them on the computer um, and see like, oh, that's like, what is that a picture of? Um, so yeah, this is like a picture of the mall or the Sears, this roof is like closed Sears, but it's like, I was really trying to take a picture of this like man on this roof. Um, similarly, let's see, we are over here. Similarly, um, this is a picture of a, a blimp, uh, but really it's a picture of this like big hole in the ground and along with um, Houston loving to like pump gas. They also love to like tear shit down and build it back up um, with like something new and expensive and um, you know inaccessible to much of the population of the, of the city. Um, you know, there's like this is I think there's a lot of data. There's a lot of arguments around it, but you know we had a hurricane in 2017 that was really hard on the on the city because we have so much concrete, we have so much um, impermeable ground. That you know, when that water drains, where does it go? It goes places without concrete, um, or it stays in those places with concrete. But it, it you know, it, it drains away from that area into places that aren't so built up and developed, like much of downtown is becoming, and much of Greater Houston, like most cities in America, I think. So walking also because it's a hot place. Um, it's, it's kind of brutal to walk during the day in most seasons. There, um, a lot of my walks. Uh, brought me to wandering out at night and I'd go with my, my dog Penny um, and we just kind of wander and I'd bring the camera and so I got to know some of this machinery some of this like infrastructure that was kind of bigger than I could imagine or understand the scale of and I started photographing these things and getting to know them and revisiting them and these things were just like all about removing material and leaving this massive hole in the ground where I could just imagine being swallowed up by. I'm not always sure what these like devices or components were meant to do. Um, but in that imagining of being swallowed up, I found this like sense of tenderness. So this is me at the, um, the job I mentioned in Houston. This is inside of a CNC milling machine, which many of the, the um, videos we saw on the little Instagram, uh, compilation was uh, made on these machines or, or those components was made on this machine. 
And this is a picture my friend took when I was inside cleaning. Um, it kind of required this constant maintenance. As you can see, it built up like this massive amount of like, almost like fluff, these chips, these this waste. Um, because we're carving material, we're cutting it away. It's a subtractive process. There's a huge amount of um, like trash that builds up. So you have to constantly get in there and clean it. And um, so my friend, uh, she shut the doors on me once. Uh, you know, she wasn't going to press any buttons or anything, but it's, it's a moment when I realized like, wow, this is like, um, the table of this machine is as big as I am. I mean, this machine weighs five tons. It has a 50 horsepower motor. It's like so capable of just like violence in like a way that I can't imagine like a human body, um, being capable of. And so me being in that space, just, I, I kept reminding of like the, the, the vulnerability of, of my own body and uh, the potential of this other machine. So here's just more pictures of things we make and, and like from this one part, all of that black, like almost like kelp seaweed, um, flotsam and jetsam, it's one of those two, someone should tell me if you know it's flotsam or jetsam, I forget which one is synthetic, which one's from the sea. Um, maybe this is both. Um, that's just from cutting this one part, just one side of it even, so. Um, just this constant kind of slurry being built up. Other materials like this fiberglass also just like completely, um, you know, filled your like nostrils when you would cut it. And the whole building smelled like this, this resin and this like basically poison. Um, all these materials I found had a very different smell in a way that um, cutting them at this high of speed and high intensity, like just kind of atomized, it seemed like any of the what these materials are made out of. So that experience, um, you know, at the, you know, the end of my time there, I could smell the difference between that acetal Delrin or the HDPE or aluminum or steel. Um, and definitely this fiberglass has its own smell. More of that seaweed. So as I mentioned, these machines are capable of like so much precision and you can see some of those tiny parts we were making, but I, you know, when they, when they messed up, it was because myself as like the machinist and the programmer, the person who was telling the machine all these things to do, if it, if the machine quote messed up or it crashed, um, that was because uh, something I did, you know, an extra decimal place or in the wrong place or an extra zero somewhere could do things like this. Um, you know, no longer is the machine cutting, it's just like putting a huge amount of energy from one thing into another, a spinning cutting tool into like a block of metal, um, into the machine itself. Um, when things failed, they failed dramatically, sometimes beautifully. As I mentioned, we were constantly making tiny, tiny things, things that at times we'd have to look at under a microscope. Much of the things we were building were um, medical components or prototypes for medical devices. So um, a lot of those materials we were using were body safe plastics, um, but tiny, tiny things. Some pictures of other components we made. At times it was like working in a factory where we'd make hundreds of something um, and I'd just kind of press a button and uh, you know, write grants and show proposals and things. Um, this was shown in the video a few times. This was we were cutting the tops off of it was like one thousand um, of these syringes. That was kind of demoralizing. Uh, it's a piece out of that Delrin, that acetal, copolymer Delrin. It's kind of a lonely place. Um, we also made 3D printers that were like, quote, industrial. Um, I think we're kind of like the, the Theranos of the 3D printing world. There's a few actually of uh, people who, you know, have some great idea for a 3D printer, but really they're just more and more expensive glue guns, uh, much of them, the kind of uh, 3D printing where you're depositing plastic um, drop by drop. So I mentioned there was a project that brought me back to Houston, and that was um, this project that I ended up calling U-Screw. Uh, it was about a security 
screw or a tamper proof screw that I wanted to make to replace those tamper proof screws that I saw in the world. Um, it was something I really experienced in New York riding the subway or going to like institutions like museums and uh, universities, places like that, where you go to the restrooms or you just look around the hallways or um, the subway platform or on the train itself. The ways those things are held together, those, the furniture or the dividers, the partitions, they're held by these very specific kind of screws that you can't just take apart um, with an average screwdriver. Um, in some ways, they're kind of empty gestures. They're kind of like empty accusations. They're, uh, you know, you can go buy these drivers uh, from any catalog or even you know, some hardware stores. But I, I started collecting images of them. Like whenever I go out in the world, um, I find different, um, you know, I'd use a restroom and find these different uh, security screws that were being used. So it kind of has its own catalog uh, that's building um, on another Instagram page. So to make my project happen, um, I knew it required a certain amount of precision. And this is um, a language I wanted to learn, this precision manufacturing language, because I, I wanted to have an intimate relationship to this project. I didn't want to just hand it off to somebody. I mean, I certainly didn't have the money um, coming out of university as an undergraduate um, to do this, just sub it out to somebody. Um, so I, I came back to Houston and I, I ended up, um, you know, I moved in with my folks for a little while and I had this milling machine that, uh, my grandfather left me and we retrofitted it to uh, be able to be controlled by, um, computers and those computers allow you to, you know, cut things out with, um, you know, the precision, but also the kind of flexibility that like a human hand can't necessarily like, cut these arcs for this, this smiley face. So here's some, some drawings of, of what these components needed to be so that I understood kind of what the material had to be and how the machine had to navigate that. So I got back to Houston and I went to trade school for a while actually, um, trained to be a machinist. Um, and this was right in, there was a big oil bust in, uh, late 2014, early 2015. So that no one was really hiring as it turned out. Um, but I had this like certificate on top of my art school degree. Um, so I ended up just kind of finding odd jobs. And in addition to the, the teaching that I kind of had uh, part time, I found these kind of odd manufacturing jobs that involved, um, you know, places where I could keep working on this project, this use group project, make these better and better. Um, here's some, uh, Kind of other homages to the, to the public bathrooms that I was making these like fridge magnets out of plastic. So I eventually got the screw project to a point where they were functional. You know, for a while it was just kind of like you could make it look like a screw. You could kind of make it work um, uh, because what you're looking at here is just Photoshop. I could cut out the head and I could kind of get it close. Um, but you know, these weren't very uh, easy things to make. They would take hours and hours just to like get a few that were decent enough to actually hold something together. So eventually I did get some, some uh, you know, more experience and more kind of capabilities uh, from working in other places and just kind of time and experimentation. And eventually I got the opportunity to um, install these in a way that uh, was like a commission to an airport in Houston. Texas. Um, so they bought a handful of screws, um, and that was able to, that was, that let me be able to like make more and more of these at like a better quality and um, where I did eventually sub them out to another person to work on them. Um, before, you know, and still, um, these screws were, um, intended to, like I said, replace the existing screws in these public spaces, these tamper proof screws, these screws that were saying, don't touch this thing. Um, I wanted that screw to become this like little wink, this power play um, into like who had control over those spaces, those, those semi private, semi public spaces that are restrooms in these kinds of buildings. It's probably the weirdest art installation I've ever done. Um, it's definitely a strange feeling to run around an airport with a bunch of tools and take stuff apart. 
and they're still mostly there. Um, I say mostly because they've done some renovations, and I think some people have noticed them too. And you can get them out with enough focus or, or two little ballpoint pens with enough force. Um, but really, you need that key to install and remove them. So, um, in some ways, I'm like locking the institution out of itself. That being said, I gave all the maintenance people I met um, a copy so that they actually had to do work that could. So besides this airport, I've been installing these kind of all over. Whenever I travel, I bring a little kit. So there's one in the Guggenheim, there's one in the Met Brewer, um, there's one in the Whitney, um, some other museums in Texas. Um, here's a quick little video I made of, quote, the process of making this, say quote, because this is like a dramatization. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I remember uh, Coco worked on these beautiful signs for the restrooms at the Fab and used some of them. I was really honored. Um, so I eventually quit that that job where we saw all these, um, you know, Instagram stories and things at the beginning, um, but. In my time working there, I was collecting like the scraps from some of the projects we've been working on because um, my uh, boss just like refused to recycle. Not that he was, you know, um, they were just, it was a busy time. Um, and I don't know. Anyway, so these parts are going to be thrown away anyway and uh, rather than recycled because it turns out it's not really profitable to recycle, so they just got thrown out. So that's kind of, that's capitalism for you. Um, so I kept them and I just kind of had them in my studio garage for like those two years. And then I realized, you know, I was not going to be here forever. And I, I got invited to do in that space, wherever that is. And I got invited to do a, a show of chairs, artist made chairs in Fort Worth, Texas. And so I just kind of, balance these together and clamp them together and um, found a way to sit or like be held by these pieces, these bones. Um, and then once I figured that out, I kind of drilled all these holes and they're bolted together from all the sides. So it's actually a pretty stable um, thing, even though it's just kind of made up of this like precarious stack. So there's me like drafting, testing it out. And there's all the pieces with um, holes that go through you know, there's like I guess a pattern of five or six holes that go all the way through every piece in the same location. And there is the chair. I started making these candles um, out of paraffin wax, um, which, as I understand, is also a petroleum product. Um, and they they made them lavender scented, of course. Um, Precision candles because I wanted them to engage with that CNC machine that we saw um, a few pictures back that I was working on. I just started doing this this like um, ritual of like cleaning the machine so much it it there added another layer to it where these candles became part of the the cleansing of that digestion process. Here's a little excerpt from a video I made called Gathering Dust.
and uh, Peter, I think it is that the song in the in the video before was by Julie Cruz. Just FYI. So I made a lot of these candles, and I made um, molds on the same machine that these candles are then lit inside of. Um, you know, using the same kind of techniques that we would use to make um, molds, which was another side of the company where we made these kind of mat these large um, run of production molds, rather than like making a silicone mold of something, um, you can actually cut a mold out of aluminum or steel if you need to make tons of the same part um, with extreme accuracy and durability. Um, that's kind of what the metal allows you to do. So I actually don't have a picture of the molds, unfortunately, um, and they're in my studio. Um, but I, I made a bunch of these candle molds um, and they ended up you know, fitting in these, each of these holes on this machine table are exactly 0 0.625 inches or 5 eighths of an inch. So the candles like interface with this machine in this really beautiful way. Um, like they were only, you know, their purpose was to, was to join this machine. There's another third one. I also made um, these like, they're not real fungi, fungi, fungi um, but these plastic mushrooms um, that also interfaced with the machine in the same way that were like kind of sprouting out of the machine's table for that same video. Um, oh gosh, well, about a year ago, um, I was invited to do a project at a space in Austin, Texas called Cage Match Project. That's like a 20 by eight foot um, cargo trailer um, that has this cage built around it. It's just kind of like in this parking lot um, out in Austin, joined with this um, institution called the Museum of Human Achievement, which you can see in the back there. Um, and there's a little bit of a budget, which is beautiful. Um, the city of Austin is pretty generous to artists, and this project was supported by that. And, and so there was a stipend, which is, was super exciting. Um, I've been playing with this idea of glove making um, but about a year ago in that spring and had been making these six finger gloves but wasn't really sure what to do with them. So I thought about how could they fill this space? How could they take up this space or occupy this, this trailer? And so I made this, this um, oh, that's out of order. Okay, we can go back to that. <laughs> um, that is super out of order. Well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> Here's a picture of some of these molds I was making. Uh, we can talk about the glove project in a minute here. Um, so here's um, a mold that I made for wax, but also I cast lead into it. And this is aluminum um, that's carved. And then these two pieces mate together with like a perfect parting line, where there's almost like no flashing between them. And there's one of the, the casts that came out of that. It's, it's um, one of my, I guess my studio assistant in Houston was my dog, Penny, um, and she would, you know, it was in her nature to bring me things. So this was like a mouse that I scanned and then 3D scanned um, and then kind of added this uh, hexagonal layer to. So they were kind of a feature in the show that I did um, in the fall of 2018. It was all about kind of hands and touch and um, reaching out for things that like wouldn't reach back. Uh, here's that snake. Its um, ultimate uh, destination was this uh, pipe, these two pipes that were intersecting, but there was no water flowing between them. They were kind of like unable to, to hold or to pass material through. And this snake is revolving in this endless um, spiral. And this piece is called Moonlighting. There's um, the back of the snake, which is carved out of this material called HDPE. It's really common plastic. Um, it's quite easy to melt, actually, um, without burning. Many uh, milk jugs are made out of it. Um, so this isn't an example of it, um, but, you, but I have made things out of like ground up and melted HDPE. It's like a really cheap way to get like a big block of plastic to carve. Um, this is a piece um, out of carved copper and carved HDPE in the back. Yeah, it's cool stuff. And it's it's definitely like super recyclable as an art material. 
Um, this piece is called Don't Close the Door, and you can see those paws come back underneath this like manhole cover. Um, this is another kind of mold. Um, well, it's, a, it's similar to the candle mold, but it has this different kind of sprue system or, or plumbing system. This is my take on an injection mold. And you saw some um, really basic injection molds in the, in the first video, the Instagram video. Um, but there's like a port that comes from the outside of the mold like most molds and with great force materials pushed in through that port and it's fed through these runners and these sprues to um, eventually depart. But I made a mold that if you used it, it would kind of like lock together. Um, there's not really undercuts, but the way um, the part would like never come out quite right. Um, even though these things fit perfectly, um, it's this kind of mold that's unable to reproduce. And again, these like paws are featured there. Um, so in, in injection molding, um, the material starts out as these pellets and they go into a hopper and they're, they're heated and they're pushed through an extruder, which is actually kind of like how most of those 3D printers work, the kind that I was joking are like expensive glue guns. Um, but an injection mold instead uh, goes to a single port that then feeds um, a cavity. Oh, this was gross. Um, this is another material that you run through the injection molds to clean out the nozzles. Here's a detail of one of uh, the little paws. And you can see all the tool marks on the um, aluminum mold. I was also casting lead, as I mentioned. Um, I started making these MDF molds, um, but then I moved to making them out of aluminum. This was a uh, a squirrel that I 3D scanned that again my dog brought me. I mean, this is a possum that is uh, also cast out of lead, but instead of the mold being a cavity, um, this is one example where 3D printing I think worked for me. It's not something that I really reach for a lot, um, but each of these pieces was its own little positive and I pressed them into. Um, a specific kind of sand that can stand up to high temperatures. I think we have some in the foundry at BCU. Um, please don't cast lead into it. Um, I don't recommend using this material. <laughs> um, but basically you, you can push a solid or a positive material into it and gently pull it out and you have that cavity. So I, pour, I poured the metal into that. Um, like some of the other plastic pieces in here and like many of the found objects in the show um, that we saw earlier, or some of these objects in the show, then go back. Um, pieces and the materials that made a lot of these things were cast off materials and parts, things that were broken or unusable or um, just thrown out. So a lot of the plastic was recycled, um, either found or melted down. Um, the lead was, was taken from like wheel weights, went to a tire store and they have old wheel weights they can't use, so I melted that into, into these things. Uh, but since I am uh, talking to y'all today, please don't use lead. Um, even though I was being safe, it's definitely not worth like, the risk. There's metals out there that melt at low temperatures that can do similar things. I recommend that. This is a video of the show from 2018. Wow, 2018. I'm going to hurry on through because I think we got, I'm going to leave some time for questions if anyone has them. You can kind of see better in the objects, the details here. So yeah, this, this possum was like this shattered possum with like pieces, um, this like kind of impossible puzzle to come back together. And this is a sad picture, but this is, this is um, what I used to scan the, the, for this model. Um, that again, Penny brought me. She's very sweet, but she is a wild animal. That's her on a chair I made um, back in like 2011. It's like take on a Donald Judd chair, but I added a shelf because I think 
be more useful and comfortable. Um, in undergrad, I, I wanted to share some pictures of undergrad. I was also interested in this like public space and this idea of like death in public space in the way that like I think I was interested in like um, like the loneliness that I feel in that. And, and I think it was in that soft jaw show, a lot of that came through. There's these rat traps that New York uses a lot, but you can see them in Richmond and many cities um, that look like rocks. There's just these plastic injection molded rocks um, that are, have rat traps inside them. They're just like little killing devices that are supposed to also be beautification. So I started taking those out of Tompkins Square Park and then replacing them with plaster and fiberglass casts that were just houses. Um, without the, the death machine inside. Um, so back to the glove project. I was born with a six finger on my left hand. Um, oh, these are really out of order. What's going on? <laughs> um, cool. So I started making these gloves. And uh, I tried a, a couple different ways to make them, but I ended up spraying on latex and thin layers uh, to this form, essentially making a glove mold and peeling it off. So it was kind of like an offering to that lost um, finger that I never got to know, I never got to use. Um, it was like a way to remember it or imagine a life for it that it wasn't given to. Kind of didn't fit the mold of, um, you know, I guess when I was, when I was born, it, not that there was something wrong with me, but uh, there was something not normal about having a six finger. So here's again that cage, um, cage match project. And so um, I proposed to make these six little pedestals that would rotate and uh, on each of them would be suspended um, a six finger glove and it would kind of have its own specific path in this ensemble. And I drew these all in, in CAD in a program called Fusion 360. Um, because there were such mechanical requirements of this installation, um, things had to fit a certain way. So working in CAD made sense here. Um, it's not always the case. Sometimes it's kind of like a, a tunnel that doesn't really lead you to what's important. But for this project, it made sense for me. So these are just renderings. And here's um, the kind of conductor of the whole circuit. This is a, a motor just tied to a pulley. And so a single motor pulled the entire group, but they each kind of flopped around in their own way. There was something kind of great when you know, I installed it and like, whatever, things went to plan. You know, it's like, there were kind of no surprises because it was all sort of figured out in the computer first. Um, but when the sun set, um, my partner and I were, were setting it up together and I brought these LED spotlights and I was just like, let's just try these. Um, I thought they would be kind of be kind of like outrageous, but it was kind of this delightful performative surprise where they became this like theatrical, um, recital or, or like improvisational performance. Um, so I, I felt like these did kind of get a life that that six finger wasn't, wasn't given. And I called this project My Little Runaway. And it was up for maybe two months in Austin. And so, you know, out in the weather, things rusted, things broke down, that latex degraded. But it kept running, it kept spinning. Um, I had been playing with some ideas of performance uh, before. Uh, in the video with the candles, I also was uh, a character in that video. This, like, very much the same character that I performed every day in my job. Uh, this, like, maintenance technician or this this person with this relationship to this machine. Um, and I did another performance uh, in 2017 with a very close friend of mine, Alexa West, whose work um, involves a lot of choreography and, and 
movement and in contact with other people. Um, and so she's also from Houston. I invited her um, back down and we hung out and I, I had this machine that I had built from bits and pieces. That was a CNC router, a four by eight foot, uh, you know, footprint machine. And we started playing around with like different movements and through like programming the machine, um, these, they became these kind of like, uh, uh, what would you call them? Like notation. Um, for us to respond to the machine or like have these different, um, you know, uh, sets of options. And so these were like 15 minute performances that we did at this space called um, the silos, which is a um, repurposed uh, rice uh, silo. And the drawings that were made from each performance um, were sometimes a little bit different. Um, we kind of mix it up between performances, um, but it would kind of like ask for things and it would take things and we would give it things and um, it would, you know, push us and pull us and it ended up leaving these marks in the blue foam that we were, um, I guess, dancing on. A quick little excerpt here. Um, I guess the last thing, um, something I'm really missing these days is like cooking with people. Um, I think it's a, a, maybe not part of my practice, but I think it's a part of like what gives me life to keep making work. Um, it's just like sharing meals with people. And um, starting in 2018 with my friend Shana Hohen, we started doing shows in my backyard. Shana went to um, BCU also, um, sculpture. Um, it just started out as really casual um, kind of gatherings, but food was always central to it. Uh, where the yard was was like kind of not in central Houston, so it was kind of feeding people as a way to get them out um, out of the middle of the city uh, to go come hang out with us and some art. And so we kept curating these shows. We did two shows together, um, one in the spring, one in the summer. And then um, Shannon moved to L.A., and I, I picked up, just keep kept uh, organizing these shows through different seasons. And that weather was always a collaborator. So, you know, we had a show where it was like freezing outside. So we had heaters everywhere. Some of the art was even lit by like uh, heaters. Um, sweltering summer. Um, and we had some really beautiful times too. Um, but it's definitely something I miss right now is, is hanging out and sharing beautiful things and good food with each other. I hope we get to do that again soon. Um, cool. If anyone has any questions, um, I'm going to let this play. This is just kind of what the, the project I'm working on now. These objects are from, um, I've been taking all the kind of graphics from the original Sims, which are like these tiny little thumbnails, uh, relative to like high definition video, they're these tiny little, little frames, um, that represent, you know, a toilet or a bathtub or um, a bookcase or, uh, you know, all the things that like a, a person would need to live in a home, um, they're all represented by these little images, but those, they're only images. They're not actually three dimensional forms. If you actually go into like the guts of the back end of the, of the Sims game, they're really just images. That's all they are. So like, if you think about the perspective from, um, the characters of the game, which are actually three dimensional forms themselves as they interact with their homes, 
I kept imagining what it would be like to to be in their perspective um, and to like see, you know, see um, like a chair and sit in it, but it's actually just this like infinitely thin cut out form. It could like never provide rest. Um, you know, a shower could never provide like a warm bath because they're just these intersecting planes of graphic uh, two dimensional rather than a three dimensional thing. So I've been redrawing these from those two dimensional forms in like um, fairly extreme detail because I want them to like be more real or as real as they could be. Um, in a recent uh, series of live streams I've been doing on this YouTube page too, I've been walking um, whoever's interested into the different steps of drawing like a bathtub from, from just these images in The Sims. So I've been taking fragments of these 3D models and uh, making positives out of them uh, at life size, or at least what life scale would be if, if we were in the game, you know, what we would experience, I guess, in relation to, to our own scale, our own bodies. And the plan is to cast them in um, gummy. And I've started making small ones. Um, gummies just like, you know, like a Haribu gummy bear. So they are potentially edible, um, these little things. And I've been, you know, coloring them and just kind of trying to make them look like the thing, but knowing that they'll never be the thing. There's this kind of like, um, you know, failure in the object in the way that like the original game didn't provide uh, the comfort or the rest or the sustenance. Um, these, I guess, could provide, provide sustenance, but they're like their own vulnerable little um, squishy things. So, yeah. Um, Maybe some. We have a few more minutes. If folks want to ask any questions, um, I can hang out in the chat, um, and I'll put this video back on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to answer questions. Hang out for the next five minutes. I'm watching in the chat. I'm glad it stopped raining. If anyone's in Richmond, it was like really intense rain for the last what felt like twelve hours solid. I guess I could say one more thing about this project. Um, the view that the player is given, like the, the privileged view of the player in the original Sims limits the viewport or like the, the image that you get of the house and the characters and everything, it's limited to this three quarter view. You get like four rotations of a three quarter view. Um, so you also never really get to see behind the objects as the player. Um, but also the characters would never get to see behind the objects because they only have that um, thin plane to experience. Um, so I've been making these from that three-quarter view only, like kind of extruding them into into this space until they contact the ground um, that they would rest on. So they're kind of locked in this limited uh, perspective too. Oh, that's sweet, Nicole. <laughs> I thought it'd be fun to try to have uh, my face on there too, but that's always a little, a little wild. But I wish you could see everybody's faces too. I thought about doing a Zoom thing, but I thought for all the different multimedia, this would be the simplest um, medium. And as I mentioned to um, folks in the beginning, this will be saved. I'll send Nicole a link if the link changes from this link. Um, so folks who didn't get to join us today um, can see this later. Or if you have you know, anything you had a question about, if you really want it, I guess you could go back and watch it. Um, and uh, you know, if you all have any questions too, um, I'm sure Nicole could get you in touch. Uh, yeah, it's good to talk to everybody today. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, something that I've actually, so Nicole's asking or, or says, um, you know, she's interested in my relationship to waste and recycling. I think not being connected to a studio right now has really put me in better touch with that. And I think all of us are probably experiencing a different relationship to what we consume right now, just like thinking about food. Um, but even what like art supplies are, um, I think in Houston, because I was so, you know, 
surrounded by this constant like throwing away of like say we had like a block of material that was one pound and like the piece that we got out of it was like an ounce that was like kind of a constant situation so um just kind of being surrounded by this like mass of waste was and being like kind of culpable in that too i think made me want to hold on to these things like they became precious from like that work or that like heat there was something like uh, intrinsic still in all those all those chips Cool. Well, Y'all are welcome. Um, yeah, reach out, hit me up. I'm around. <laughs> um, enjoy the rest of y'all's afternoon. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Nicole, for inviting me. This was this was fun. Hope to hope to do more things like this soon. Y'all be y'all be well. <laughs>